likes a housewarming gift, don't they? Yeah, usually it's like a basket with cheese and crackers, maybe some wine. And when you get the uh, basket and it has uh, oils in it uh, to rid your home of demons, that may be a sign you've picked the wrong home. That's what happens to one renter when the landlord drops off that oh-so-friendly gift basket. That story in a recent EPP bonus episode of Real Ghost Stories Online. If you want to hear it, sign up to be an EPP on the website, realghoststoriesonline.com. Becoming an EPP supports the show. It helps keep us on the air and cover all of our hard costs of distributing the show. And you get all the bonus episodes, more than 60 of them, exclusive video content and more. Sign up to be an EPP right now, realghoststoriesonline.com. And thank you. Welcome to Real Ghost Stories Online. Call in your real ghost story now at 855-853-4802 or write in at realghoststoriesonline.com. You are about to enter the world of the unknown and quite possibly the undead. This is Real Ghost Stories Online. And uh, happy uh, pre-Halloween. We're getting pretty close. We are. We're getting very close to the uh, the uh, one of the busiest, our Christmas, essentially. Mm-hmm. One of the most joyous times of the year at Real Ghost Stories Online. The phone number here, 855-853-4802. Of course, you can write it on the website, realghoststoriesonline.com. It's Tony and Jenny Bruski joining you, as we always do. And today, your calls and your stories as told by you. I'm excited to some interesting ones to uh, to share today. If you're a new listener to the show, this is a program, as you may have gathered, all about dead people and ghosts and, and maybe not even dead people, but something on the other side. And uh, if uh, you want to share your story with us, you're welcome to a call, in, call it in or write it in. And we do this show year round, uh, 365 days of the year. You can listen to our show and uh, you can uh, get new episodes every single week, not just Halloween season. So uh, if you're uh, excited and thinking, gosh, darn it, Halloween is coming and uh, the spooky season is going to end. Oh, no, it never ends here. No, we even have some Halloween decorations that stay up year round. <laughs> it's kind of fun because when Halloween season comes around, you, you end up finding the Halloween decorations. And I go, I'm keeping this up all the time. I'm never <laughs> taking this down. And like I got a kind of an older, you know, antique skeleton uh, hanging thing that you would have hung in your house. It's one of those paper skeletons. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's circa what, like 1960s or 70s mm-hmm. or so. And uh, I got saw it at an antique store and got it for a really good deal. And I'm like, yeah, I, I'm, this is going on my door and it's never coming down. <laughs> so that's uh, kind of the fun uh, of what we do here. So uh, we'd love to hear your stories. Uh, favorite Halloween candy, Jenny? Uh, Twizzlers. Twizzlers? Mm-hmm. Really? That's my all-time favorite candy anyway. Like that's where they, they came in the little rectangles or like kind of mini Twizzlers. Is that right? Is that how the fun size looked back in the day or was it like the longer? That or the individually wrapped long ones. Long ones. Okay. But we lived so far out in the country, we didn't get to trick-or-treat a whole lot. Mm -hmm. So my parents used to go and say, okay, you can get a bag of whatever you want. Sure. We'll call it good. So I always got Twizzlers. And then when Twizzlers Pull and Peel came out, Mm -hmm. oh, my God, that was my favorite. So I know you've said that, but did you ever go trick-or-treating? When I was really little. Other than than to the old folks' home where you were scared because you were so little? That was horrible. Um, Yeah, we went trick-or-treating. Okay. but, But, you know... I was probably nine when I had to kind of sure. quit just because we didn't have neighbors with kids our age. So sure. That's yeah. true. Least favorite? Oh, um, gummy spiders. Gummy spiders? Yeah. Those are delicious. No. <laughs> those are fun. I don't like spiders. Remember they used to make like a Ghostbusters one back in those days. <laughs> and you like where you peel the film off the one side. Mm-hmm. And then it's like, it's like, it's more gummy than gummy. It's, it's almost slimy. Yeah. Those were fun. Okay, what's your favorite Halloween candy? My favorite Halloween candy uh, probably was the Reese's Peanut Butter Cups mm-hmm. when I was little. Like the little tiny ones. Yeah. I mean, the bigger ones are great, too. I mean, either or, I, I totally take. Um, and least favorite was, <laughs> it's actually relating to peanut butter. They called it the Peanut Butter Kisses. And they still make those, and I, I, I hate them. My dad, that's his favorite. Okay. Um, Because we are so much alike. (laughs) But it's another way that we're we're very different in uh, in what we like. Um, It's those, the the black and orange, uh, you know, wrapped things that are kind of like wax paper. 
And then I think I think the candy almost resembles wax. It's kind of like a, a taffy-ish texture. And supposedly there's a little dab of peanut butter on the inside of those. Um, I've yet to ever discover a little bit of peanut butter in there. They, they kind of taste like a, a bastardized bit of honey or bit of honey uh, with uh, a tinge of peanut butter. You know what I'm talking about? No. You don't know what I... Oh, I, I, I have to find a picture of that. I'll find it during one of the calls and show you. Okay. But uh, yeah, that was my least favorite. And and they seem to be rather popular when I was a kid. It's like the cheapest candy you can possibly buy. Okay. Um, Like you can get like the giant bag for like one ninety nine. So a lot of folks who get it. And you always end up with all these things. My dad loves it because then he couldn't like, oh, I'll take all those from you. <laughs> you go, dad. Merry Christmas. Ugh. Yeah. Good stuff. All right. Uh, on to our ghost stories for today. Like I said, 855-853-4802 is our phone number here at Real Ghost Stories Online. Let's go to Josh in Texas. Hi. This is uh, Josh Zapata calling from Dallas, Texas. Uh, my story is a little different than the one that I've heard. Of. I'm a new listener. I uh, started listening about two days ago, um, but uh, this, I think this is the perfect place to share my story. Um, it started back on a family vacation back in June. Uh, me and my father are avid deep sea fishermen, and uh, we decided to take a nighttime deep sea um, excursion or adventure, um, and it kind of ended up different than what we thought. Um, we headed out about 9 o'clock in, in the summertime over here in Texas. It usually gets dark around 9. Uh, so we headed out with all of our supplies and everything on the boat, uh, ready for about a five to six hour trip. We were going about 30 miles off of the coastline uh, from Port Aransas. Uh, Port Aransas is a little island off the coast of Texas. But um, we headed out and um, everything was normal. You know, we had uh, no luck with any, catching anything yet. Um, but we, I think we caught more than what we bargained for. Um, at around 11 o'clock, we noticed that we started having some, uh, some technical failures with some equipment on our boat. Um, as far as our uh, radar and stuff like that, it detects things underneath the boat and um, some of the, uh, the electronics on the boat is in lights and stuff were started to fail and uh, we didn't really understand why. But um, as far as we knew, everything was charged. The battery on the boat was good to go. Actually, there's several batteries on the boat, but they were all good to go. They were charged. It's a fairly new boat and we've never experienced any type of mechanical issues up until this point. But uh, around 11 o'clock, um, the boat all of a sudden just lost power. And uh, I don't know if you've ever been out in the middle of the ocean whenever it's nighttime and you have no lights around you, but it is very, very dark. And we're talking about a new moon, so it wasn't really any new or any moonlight at all. But um, we're sitting in a very, very dark place in the middle of the ocean. You can just, and the water is very, very still, very, very calm. Um, we normally um you throw down anchor at this point but we didn't find that necessary because we thought this was a situation where we could just kick start the boat and you know start running again we weren't really sure why it stopped in the first place but um we figured maybe something the wiring came loose or you know uh, there's just all kinds of things that could happen but we were we were determined to figure out what it was because we were ready to go home especially at that point but um we um all of a sudden we had taken a break to kind of talk things over, try to figure out what was going on. But we noticed that our boat was, um, it was kind of moving. And it's, um, I mean, it's not, you know, I guess different for a boat to move or not, there's nothing special about that, especially being in the middle of the ocean. But um, it was just, it was weird because it, it seemed like our boat was moving against the current. And normally it doesn't happen. If your boat's gonna float, it's gonna float with the current, with the waves. Uh, basically, whatever way the wind's blowing, that's what, which, which way your boat's going to go. And this is not a sailboat. This was just a fisherman's boat. It's about, um, I would say our boat's about 15 feet long, 15 to 16 feet long. But um, we, um, actually, it's 22 feet. Thank you very much. Uh, we were moving against the current, which was which was very, very strange. That, that never happened. So we knew something was up. But um, we noticed that about 15 minutes after we had stopped moving, or after we start, started moving, we actually stopped moving. Um, and it seemed like our boat was staying in one place, one specific place. And uh, we, um, I mean, the, the wind was still blowing, the, the current was still moving, but we were not moving any, any longer. And again, we were not, we didn't throw the anchor or anything like that. 
uh, we didn't drop anchor, so there was really no reason for us to be moving. And at that point, we knew that that was a little different than uh, what should normally be happening, especially moving against the current. So um, we, uh, whenever we got to this point in the ocean, it just felt like there was just this feeling, this heaviness feeling of like dread and like a sadness. And we both kind of felt it at the same time. Like uh, we both kind of got like this feeling of just depression, like something bad had happened. Um, which of course, you know, being stuck out in the middle of the ocean is bad, but um, it, was, it was just a totally different feeling, a very heavy feeling. Um, and uh, we didn't know what to make. What to, what to think or what to make of it um but uh we stayed there and then uh, i mean we 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 floated in that area for a good i don't know i would say half hour until all of a sudden it was like whatever was holding the boat there just i mean its grasp was lost so um after about 30 minutes all of a sudden all of our electronics on the boat the lights everything they, they popped back on and uh the boat started right up and um we we weren't sure what happened and uh, we were able to write down the coordinates of where where we were before uh, um, we headed back to shore. And um, it turns out whenever we researched it that the coordinates that we looked up, there had been a shipwreck of a couple of fishermen where their boat had gone down. And uh, the uh, captain of the boat, he actually survived, but the person, there was actually two people that was with him. One was severely injured. Um, and uh, the other one, he did not make it. He actually ended up getting burned and then drowned um, at that, pretty much at, right at that coordinate. So I don't know if it was something with him um, or something them telling us to get out of there, but apparently the boat was, uh, it became wrecked due to a uh, engine fire. And um, they, the help, uh, they were eventually, the captain and um, the other guy was eventually rescued, but the one that did not make it, he ended up drowning and I think they did recover his body uh, but uh, it was just very strange that that would happen at that point so uh, anyways very different story than uh, what I've been hearing but I thought you guys um, you know would enjoy listening to that um, and it's just crazy and if you want I know there are facts about it there is it is on the internet so feel free to look it up but um, very very crazy situation very crazy story and if there's anything worse than it's being in a dark house it's being in the middle of a dark ocean with no light that thing, there's no darkness like that kind of darkness so anyways enjoy the show you guys keep on doing what you're doing i appreciate you guys and i uh, will talk to you later you know i wonder if in this case since they had you know obviously no light nothing to be able to see at all mm -hmm. if having their sight kind of i guess almost blindfolded if that made them more aware of the feelings of dread and, and sadness when they were where that ship had sank. I would think so. Yeah. You know, it, it's it's one of those things where, you know, when you, you start to lose some of your senses, other ones become heightened. Mm -hmm. And I think that that could very well be true of that. I mean, you may think, you know, the natural thought is, oh, you know, vision, hearing, smell, you know, smell, sight, taste, all that. But I, I think it's another one of those senses that we don't, you know, the sixth sense, essentially, that also becomes heightened at that point, too. I think so. That's a very uh, creepy story. That, that would be horrible to be stuck out there. Have you ever been on a boat where the, the engine stops? No. No, I, I have, and it's not super fun. Now, it's, it wasn't like at sea, but it's, you know, it was out in, in Lake Winnebago uh -huh. in, in Wisconsin, which is, it's it's a fairly large lake, but you can see shore from both sides. But you, you know, it's it's not really, you know, super swimmable if you're in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. You kind of have to wait for help at some point or another. Um, but it does happen because there's plenty of boats around there. Um, but my dad, I've been out there with my dad and like couldn't get the engine going. And we, I remember sitting there for, gosh, I think the longest time was probably a good 15, 20 minutes. And then finally gets the engine running again. Uh huh. But it's kind of nerve wracking. Oh, yeah. Especially when you're a child. Like, what are you going to do? Yeah, and you're out of Starburst, and that's the only reason that you went on the boat to begin with, because well, you were bribed. Could you imagine your dad? I mean, yeah, you were scared as a child, but what, what you know, what is he going to do? <laughs> He's so calm about everything. Well, he is. I mean, no, I mean, I, I can imagine my dad is, uh, you know, well, somebody will rescue us, and, you know, they'll have a beer and uh, See, <laughs> talk I, about the, the game on the way back. <laughs> I would just be like, oh, my God, here I am with a toddler. What am I going to do? Yeah, you know? no, that's not, I don't think uh, was, at least 
if that was going through his mind, uh, I, I don't think he conveyed it in any way, shape, or form. I was freaking out, but that's just me. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, I, I don't necessarily need other people to freak me out or to be freaked out around me to freak out myself. Right. Um, I, I'm, I'm fully capable of doing that <laughs> to an extreme extent all on my own. Uh, but, you know, so, I mean, it's one of those things where you know, he was, you know, intentionally or not trying to do the right thing of staying extremely calm but that's just kind of in his nature no matter what Mm -hmm. is going on um uh it didn't necessarily calm me down in fact that annoys the living shit out of me (laughs) to be completely honest i there's nothing worse to me than i mean there is worse things but figure speech when there's something that that should be really disturbing someone or or causing some concern at least some hair of concern Mm -hmm. okay or at least show a little bit of concern not not like no concern at all okay um and the person who should be concerned is doesn't appear to be whatsoever that is very annoying to me because it's like what am i the only one that's aware of what what's going on right now now what if it's a case where they're like okay this is alarming, but I'm going to stay calm. And you, sure. they, and you know that. Is that annoying no, to you? it still annoys me. I mean, it still annoys you? Because you can stay calm and still show concern. Well, what if they say, I'm okay, I'm concerned about this. But I'm, I'm gonna... better then. Yeah. Okay. When it's at least acknowledged. Because that's what I said. Okay, I'm sorry. I, I misinterpreted. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, with, with at least the acknowledgement of it, yes. Okay. It, it's the, uh, the, eh. <laughs> it's like, please, just, just a tad, just a hair of it. Okay, <laughs> but uh, you know it, 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 it's one of those things. It's a good trait to have, I think, for you know, for a lot of people. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but but uh, I don't know. For me, not so much. Kind of the odd duck when it comes to that sort of thing. Sure. So anyhow, eight five five eight five three forty eight zero two is our phone number here at Real Ghost Stories Online to share your real ghost stories with us. We would love to hear them. And Jenny, by the way, is now informed on what a peanut butter kiss is. Yes, it looks like a piece of taffy. See, I was thinking it was like a version of the Hershey Kiss. Oh, no. That had like peanut butter. And I was like, how can that be bad? That would be wonderful. That, But no chocolates involved in this candy. No, it looks like taffy. And yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's almost, and it's, it's like, I'm not a huge saltwater taffy fan, mm-hmm. but I would take saltwater taffy over this. This, this kind of has more so the taste of like peanut butter earwax. Oh, gross. That's what I would describe it as. It's a giant wad of peanut butter earwax. That's not something you should share with others. <laughs> so there you go. Okay. They're going to have somebody saying, oh, I absolutely love those things. And well, to each their own. That That's just nothing wrong with that. Okay. I could actually, um, and by the way, that man was fishing on the, the Port Aransas area. Mm-hmm. I don't know where that is because I've never been there. Well, I know where it is, but I've never been there. But that's actually one of the popular areas on the fishing show that I do the voiceover on. Oh, the Redfish Tour? The IFA Redfish Tour, okay. which I believe is on NBC Sports <laughs> and... Yeah, if somebody are watching NBC Sports and you see a fishing show and you hear me, yeah, that is me. That's that's me on there. <laughs> but it's one of those areas where they they quite frequently fish. I've never had any paranormal topics on the show, mm-hmm. and, and I know nothing about fishing. I just read copy. <laughs> <laughs> but I just read. Oh, well, never heard that since that show. So anyhow, eight five five eight five three forty eight zero two is your phone is our phone number here at Real Ghost Stories Online for you to call in and share your story with us. Hi. Hi, Tony and Jenny. Uh, My name is Angela, and I am from Michigan. I called earlier this year with my stories of the man. It being close to Halloween, I wanted to share the story of the little girl ghost that we also have in our home. Um, We moved into our home when my son was two and my daughter was not yet born. And even though he was afraid of what he called the man, when we first moved into our house, um, it feels homey and our kids who are now teenagers are happy here. Um, Shortly after my son stopped seeing the man and stopped talking about his uncle Mike who visited him at night, um, I was hearing the sound of a child crying and calling for mama, but it didn't take me long to figure out that it wasn't my son. Um, I had learned also that there was a fire in my home a very long time ago. We live in a a very old home and um, there are even beams that are charred in our crawl space. So I began to think that it was just a residual haunting, like a recording of the past. 
And I thought that until one day when my son was three and I was pregnant with my daughter, I caught him standing with his face in the window. We have a very low window in our pantry and he was whispering to no one. I said, hey buddy, who are you talking to? And he turned around and he smiled and he said, my friend Laura. Well, I froze for a second and then he said, she's not hurt mama, she's just sad, which immediately made me think about the little girl crying that I would hear. And um, I said, well, tell Laura we have to go. And he said, bye-bye, Laura. I was creeped out, but he was happy, and I was just happy that it was no longer him afraid of the man. And um, it seemed like he wasn't seeing the man anymore. After um, my daughter was born, skipping a few years ahead, I would hear the crying more often and louder. And when my daughter was about four, I'd really think it was her. It would sound urgent and scared. So I would run to her room and she would be fine. And then when my daughter was about six to eight, um, I started getting, um, getting woken up at night by the feeling of someone grabbing my ankles and the words, Mama, wake up. And once I felt a presence over me and I heard Mama and I was groggy, but I thought my daughter had a nightmare. And when I opened my eyes, it was a girl with light brown hair and a nightgown. So for a second, I still thought it was my daughter. And the second I realized that it was not my daughter, because her face was similar, but it was not my daughter, she vanished. Um, I started becoming used to her visiting, and some nights I would even smell burning wood. Um, I have never been afraid, and again, my son loved having her as a friend when he was small, so I wasn't afraid by her. But fast forward to when my daughter was 12, um, she confided in me that sometimes there was a little girl in a room and she seemed relieved that I believed her and I told her that I had seen her too. But then my daughter teared up and said the little girl was starting to scare her, that she stands behind her pink chair, which is against the wall of her closet. Well, it's against the wall that shares her closet and that she would glare at her. Um, some time has passed, um, and my daughter has learned to pray and not give uh, the little girl any of her energy. But recently, um, this summer, my daughter had a friend spend the night, and her friend said in the morning she was very tired because she dreamed that my daughter had jumped on her in the middle of the night and woke her up. But when she looked over, she could see that didn't happen because my daughter was sound asleep which right away reminded me of the little girl. Um, and recently I heard the urgent crying again, but it had been so long. So for a second I thought someone had fallen down our stairs. We live in an old home, which, you know, in the older homes, they have the steep, real thin staircases. So I called up and my son, who is now a senior, he said, no, we're okay, and then I probably heard the cat, which I find funny because he was the first one to hear the little girl and he was friends with her. And as a side note, my husband and I seeing or hearing anything ever in our house, but I have heard something and then looked over at him before and I could tell by the look on his face that he heard it also, but that's another story. Well, I hope you have a happy Halloween, and I love the show. Thank you for letting me call. Have a good day. That must annoy the living hell out of her, too. Oh, yeah. That's, Where That's going to be a pet peeve. It's like, at the least, at the least, and he doesn't have to say it's a ghost. He just, just acknowledge that that was unexplained. Mm -hmm. That was odd. And you're good. Yeah. It, it, would, it would probably go a lot uh, or, or really mean a lot to her as far as kind of calming her nerves of knowing she's not the only one mm -hmm. that's experiencing those things. Nothing worse than hearing a child screaming as a ghost. 
now, and you can't help but wonder if that poor little girl died in the fire. Yeah. And, I mean, that is a real strong residual to be able to still smell the burning wood. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if she's gone back and looked at the history to find out when the fire was and what parts of the house and if anybody died. Maybe she doesn't want to know that. Sure. You know, you have to hope at the at the least it's just a, uh, or at the most rather, that it is a just a residual haunting, meaning it's not a conscious haunting and it's just the sounds reiterating themselves for whatever reason and she's not sitting there still yeah, in the fire actually in pain. Thank you for uh, sharing that story with us. 855-853-4802, our phone number here at Real Ghost Stories Online. As you uh, know, if you're a regular listener of the show, the show the show is supported by you guys uh, and our EPPs and our memberships there. It's only $5 a month. You get access to all of our bonus episodes of the show, more than 60 of them as of this point in time, exclusive uh, video content, and, uh, and much more as well. That's all the extras that we give our EPPs, and uh, that's what keeps this show funded and supported so we can continue to do it and distribute it. So if you're new to the show, you like the show, consider helping uh, be part of it and helping uh, keep it on the air and uh, sign up to be an EPP. Like I said, it's only $5 a month on the website, Real Ghost Stories Online. Dot com. We do greatly appreciate your contributions to keep this thing going. Let's go over to Catherine in Canada. Hi, Tony and Jenny. Uh, this is Catherine from Calgary, Canada, calling back. I had called previously about some of my experiences. Um, most notably was um, the visions coming through with the rocking chair um, and the music box. Um, and no head turning yet, Tony. I haven't been spitting out pea soup either. Um, but I so appreciate your insights um, and your encouragement. It, it really meant a lot to me. Um, so I thought I'd call back and, and maybe tell you some more stories. Um, thinking about them now, I think that they might actually um, explain, in a sense, uh, what's been going on with me. Um, my mom and my sister have both had, I don't know if I would call them visions, as opposed to, I think they're more so visitations. Um, my mom woke up in the middle of the night, um, oh, this was maybe two, three years ago, and there was a woman in her closet, and her first thought, of course, was, uh, you know, oh my gosh, somebody's, somebody's broken in, so she's sitting up in bed and she looks at the woman and she's dressed in a sari uh, like in East Indian tradition she's dressed in this beautiful I think she called it like a melon like a cantaloupe orange uh, sari it's just you know bejeweled it's got sequins very beautiful and she's looking at this woman and she's thinking okay why would somebody break into my house in a sari in the first place and, you know, up in, here in, in Calgary, we're pretty safe. We don't have a huge, um, you know, population of East Indian women who break into homes. So um, my mom kind of just asked her. She thought, oh, maybe she's lost. Maybe she, the door was open and she wandered in here. So my mom asked her, do you need help? And the woman turned around and she could see that she was East Indian descent, a gorgeous, beautiful woman. And the woman simply smiled at her, and then my mom blinked, and she disappeared. Um, so that was that was quite interesting. My mom swore that she wasn't asleep. She remembers sitting up and actually asking the woman if she needed help. Um, my sister has had a few visitations as well, uh, but they are in the physical plane. I feel mine are more in the mental plane. Um, my sister used to live alone in kind of a sketchy neighborhood, um, but it was a very safe apartment building, and uh, she always made sure that her door was locked when she went to bed at night. One night, she was sleeping, and she woke up. Uh, she didn't know why, and so she's on her phone, and she's looking at stuff in her bed, trying to go back to sleep, and she hears her front door open and shut. And then she hears footsteps, go to her kitchen, open the fridge door, shuffle around in it. She physically heard, you know, when you open the fridge and you're going through it and, you know, the bottles are clanging together and, you know, you can hear somebody's in the fridge. 
Then she hears the fridge door shut and footsteps, hurried, hurried footsteps running towards her bedroom. And this man appears in her doorway. This big hulking man appears in her doorway. And she is pinching herself, looking at her phone, looking at the time. It was about, I think she said it was about, you know, after about 2.30. And she, he looks at her and he just goes, help me. And so she's ready to throw anything at him. Um, so she picks up her bedside lamp, gets out of bed. The man turns, runs down the hall, and she hears the front door open and then slam shut. So she's just shaking. So she said that she had 911 already on her cell phone. She ha gets the lamp, sets it down, goes out into the hallway. The fridge is closed. Everything's pitch black. And she checks her front door and the deadbolt is locked. So unless it was somebody who had a key, which at that point was just myself, um, my parents and her, and locked the door after they ran out, it, it's very strange. Um, she also said that the man was blacker than black. He was like the, the, like the lighting, it was pitch black in her apartment, but this man, she could actually see the outline. And she said he filled the doorway. Um, she didn't have any facial features, but she was she knew it was a man, and just intu intuitively. Um, and just to help me, she said it was in a low kind of help, very like gravelly voice. Um, she also had in that same apartment. So I don't know, maybe if it was the physical the the apartment that was kind of the conduit. Um, a man came and. I believe he sat on the end of her bed. This was quite a few years ago as well. And just basically told her, can you just tell Tara that I'm okay? Uncle Jim is okay. And my sister didn't know what to do because the way she described him was that he was physically there. Like she, he looked like a solid human being. And all she said to him was, okay. Oh, okay. And he left. And then the next day she's in school and she's still kind of, this isn't really sitting well with her. She's feeling kind of anxious about what had happened to her the night before with, with this Jim guy, this Uncle Jim. And we didn't have an Uncle Jim. We don't know anybody named Tara. And so Brenna, my sister, is in, in class and she's sitting at the back and she's bored. It was oil and gas and it's kind of boring. And this girl looks at her and says, hey, like, can I get your notes from last class? I wasn't here. And my sister goes, yeah, no problem. By the way, I'm Brenna. And this girl goes, oh, I'm Tara. And my sister said something just clicked in her head. And she was like, did you have an Uncle Jim? And this Tara, her eyes just well up with tears. So my sister says, okay, let's head out of here we can say that we're going to the bathroom and just ch chat in the hall and Tara had told her that her uncle Jim had recently passed in a car accident and um, they were very very close he was like a, a father to her and my sister said well I'm pretty sure that he he came to me last night and he told me to tell Tara that I'm okay um, and of course, this is very emotional for, for Tara and my sister. Um, it's kind of, I guess, the confirmation as well. Um, so that's, <laughs> that's kind of the stories. I guess they're, they're still pretty positive. Um, the only negativity would be that they, they were a little bit scary, a little bit startling uh, for my mom and my sister. Um, so I think I'm going to leave it at that again. Um, I'm really interested to hear what you guys think about this, uh, just to see maybe it's a family thing. Um, and yeah, if, if especially about the, the guy in my sister's apartment, the first guy, the help me guy, uh, what that may have been. Anyway, uh, looking forward to hearing from you guys again. Keep doing what you're doing. Uh, we're going to keep listening, and uh, we're going to keep referring people to you. I believe that my sister is listening as well. 
Um, so thanks again. Love you guys so much. And we'll talk again soon. Bye-bye. Thank you for uh, sharing your story. And thank you for telling other people about the show. That's another big way that, uh, that you can help our show grow by letting friends know. She asked about whether or not this type of thing, meaning sensitivity, and I think, you know, being an empath can run in families. And yes, absolutely. It's especially seems to be a correlation of females in a family, mm -hmm. you know, grandmother, mother, sisters. It, it seems that that is more prevalent than running with males. But, you know, that is something that you find males a lot have that sensitivity mm -hmm. but it's it's real interesting so when we get stories most of the time it's oh my aunt had that or my mom had that sure um but as far as the the help me man in her apartment it sounds like a shadow person that talks yeah that's just creepy and i don't know how bad that feeling was of going to your front door and finding out it was still locked because that yeah. means there's a no way a locked door is gonna save you from whatever was in there exactly and, and and if it was not a shadow person i mean who would break or who has a key if someone has a key that they were unaware of turn around run and oh by the way I'm put the deadbolt back in for yeah, you i'll that, lock the door that's not uh yeah mm -mm. so yeah that's uh that's quite disturbing and the other part to the story was the uh, uh what was the other one well the first one was about the um the apparition of mm -hmm. the East Indian woman wearing sure. a sari. Yep. And it was just, you know, a very vivid mm -hmm. apparition. But then the last part was about um, her sister receiving a message yeah. at night about yeah. somebody she didn't know, their uncle. Mm -hmm. And it makes me wonder if her sister receives other messages like that in her dreams mm -hmm. or if she has received any while she's awake. Sure. What's interesting about that is it shows some sort of intelligence of the future mm -hmm. on the part of the ghost. Yeah. To know that by by delivering this message to this person, this person will, in fact, in, at a future point in time, meet the person that he wants the message to be delivered to, mm -hmm. which is really interesting. It is very it, much. It's almost like a, you know back to the future type thing gotta go back in i have all of the the huey lewis in my head now <laughs> from the last week i've i've heard too much huey lewis okay <laughs> but uh yeah i mean it's 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 a whole other you know caveat to you know the the skills mm -hmm. that uh a ghost may have and in this case it sounds like it, you know it was a human ghost too sure so very interesting. 855-853-4802 is our phone number here at Real Ghost Stories Online to share your real ghost story with us. Let's go to another caller. Hi. You are on the air. Hey, I love your show. I've been binge listening, and I heard one from last year, August 5th, and it was um, regarding phone calls that were going through from people that were de deceased and I wanted to share my story with you when I was a junior in high school mama died suddenly very, just suddenly of a heart attack nine months later my grandpa her husband died which um, was totally unexpected and he had lung cancer just out of nowhere my my mom was convinced he died of a, a broken heart and I was home. Um, my parents were not home yet. And this was, you know, before, um, well, I guess there were cell phones, but I didn't have one. But you had the little caller ID thing on your phone. And I was home. I'd just gotten home from school. And the phone rang, and my grandparents' number showed up. And in the meantime, the house, my grandparents' house was being put on the market by by my parents so I answered it thinking that maybe my mom was over there and I could you know she was over there calling calling home for whatever reason so when I answered it it sounded like almost like the way long-distance calls sounded back then just real staticky I didn't hear any voices there was you know nothing weird it just sounded very staticky and I just said hello mom is that you and and there was nothing so I hung up and I just thought that was weird and I realized I don't think my mom is there I think my mom is still at work 
So I never brought it up to her. I didn't want to upset her, make her mad, never brought it up. And then about a, a week later, and just to go back, the time that um, the, the number rang was always the time that my grandma would call me because she knew I would be walking in the door from school. And my grandparents were, uh, my mom was the only child, so my, my grandparents were either always at our house or we were always at their house. And every day my grandma called me to make sure I made it home from school. And I just thought that was, that was so so odd even though she died you know it was a few months prior to well less than a year prior to that um and then so a few weeks later my the phone rang again we were all home sitting down for dinner it was about 5 30 6 p.m and the phone rang and it was my my grandma's number again and my dad got it this time and he just turned white and my mom said, what's the matter? And he said, nothing, nothing. Uh, you know, there's, it's just weird. I don't, I don't want to bring it up. And so he said, he said, somehow your parents' number is calling the house. Well, it turned out not only, it only happened to me that one time, but I guess it happened to my dad on several occasions and it actually happened to my mother too. And my mom's friend worked for the phone company and so she asked, you know, her to ask her husband, hey, can you find out how this is happening because the number's disconnected over there. And he got back to my mom and said there is no way that this, you know, this line has been disconnected. There's no way that this number could be calling, calling your house. And I had told them, you know, it only happened to me the one time. And we figured out that it would call around the time that my grandparents would be on their way to our house to come hang out with us. So that's my story. Um, there's no there's no other reason I don't I don't know if it was just so ingrained in time that they were you know it was such a pattern for them to do that um why it started then and not you know like right when my grandma died or anything like that I I don't know but after we had our discussion about it and all came together it did not happen again to my knowledge um but I I just I thought you would get a kick out of that story there's no explanation so maybe they were just calling to say hi so i love your show and i'm going to become an epp member i love it keep it up i think it's probably because they were together again once the grandfather passed away that that's when the phone stuff started going on mm -hmm. you know and and not right when the grandmother died mm -hmm. just because then you know there's obviously no reason for that number to be calling their house sure so it's almost like hey guess what yeah we have an announcement to make yeah, it's, <laughs> that's a strange one especially with having somebody from the phone company confirm that that's not possible I wonder how often the phone company gets calls like that oh. or, or did back in the day when you had a lot of landlines and such probably pretty often yeah and then it's like, no, and how many times they started off as, well, no, you're crazy. Yeah. But I think there's, you know, a lot of people there would write it off as that, but then there's probably that handful that go, there's something else going on here. I think there's something else going on. Definitely. Definitely. Thank you for that call. 855-853-4802. Our number. Hi. Hi, Tony. Hi, Jenny. Um, my name is Ashley. I'm from um, Kokomo, Indiana. Um I just love your show. I recently discovered podcasts, and I don't know why I didn't do it years before. Um, I've been listening to the show for about a month and a half now, and I just love it. Um, I can't get enough of it, and you guys are great. Um, so the story I'm going to tell you guys today um, is about a house that I lived in uh, when I lived with my um, ex-boyfriend. I moved in with him like right out of high school. And, of course, you know, when you're young, you think that's a great idea. So, obviously, it wasn't at the time. But, anyway, so I moved in with him. And it was a, a cute little house out in the country. 
um, about an, an hour away from where I, you know, lived with my parents. So it was really far away from friends or family, and I was we were kind of secluded. Um, and it was in an older house, and it was really strange. Um, when you pulled up to the house, there's a big barn, or like a big garage, and you know, real close is the house. And you go into the garage, and there is a like a shed inside the garage. And it was so creepy. It always creeped me out. And it was a one-car garage, so we parked my car in there. And, you know, every night I would get off of work and I would have to pull in this garage. And to the left, there's the, the shed. And it was so old. And it was so creepy. And I always hated, you know, getting out and having to walk by this thing. And um, what was really, what was also strange was um, when he was my boyfriend at the time, he was, you know, cleaning it up and getting all the junk out from the previous owner. Uh, the date on the, you know, people put in, you know, the dates from when they built, you know, something, and it was, it was his birthday. It was August um, 15th, and I can't remember the year now, but it, it was August 15th, and then, the, you know, the year, it, but it was very old. And we, we thought that that was just kind of funny because that was my, you know, boyfriend at the time. That was his birthday, August 15th. And he just bought the house and it was, it was just kind of eerie. And so anyway, um, he worked third shift, so I was there alone. Um, I did work, but I didn't work very often. I just had a part-time job at like a movie store. So I was there home alone at night, you know, in the middle of the country, all by myself, no signs of family around. I mean, I had neighbors, but they were about a quarter mile down the road. And a lot of weird things would happen. I remember one night, I was on the computer, um, in my space or whatever, chatting or just doing something. And there was no storm. There was nothing. And I saw, I remember seeing a flash of green, like reflection on the screen behind me. And then all the lights going out. I mean, every single light in the house going out, the computer going out, everything. So I'm thinking you know, what's going on, and, you know, and so I call my boyfriend, and I'm, he's at work, and I'm like, you know, what's going on, did you pay the phone bill, you know, what's, because all, all these lights are out, there was no storm or nothing, and so he's like, well, just find a bill, find an energy bill, call the energy company, and find out what's going on, so I called, and the lady I talked to said that there was no reported, um, uh, car accidents or any, you know, power outages or any lines down or whatever. And like I said, there was no storm. Looked out the window and I could see my neighbor's house down the road and they had power because I could see their lights on, but we didn't have any power. So she's running all these tests and stuff and she tells me that whatever was the cause was something messing with the box outside or box outside. She's like, we're going to have to go outside and check it out. And I'm like, yeah, no, I'm alone. <laughs> I'm a girl, and I'm living in the boondocks, and I'm definitely not going outside to check this out because I'm totally freaked out. I'm, like, I think it was about 19 years old, and I'm like, I am not going outside. So I lock all the doors, and I barricade myself in our bedroom at the time, and he was a big gun owner, so I had about five guns at my disposal <laughs> to, to use. So at the time, I'm thinking this is someone, you know, messing with, our, you know, box and, you know, and so she's thinking, okay, or I'm sorry, the woman that I called from the, from the power company said that, oh, this is going to take us a couple hours to get on. So I'm like, all right, so I hang up with her, and about an hour later, the lights come back on. So I called them, and I said, hey, you know, thanks, guys, you know, whatever you did, and I spoke to the same woman, and I said, thank you so much, you know, my lights are back on. She's like, honey, we didn't do anything. She's like, I can't explain why your lights are back on. She's like, but they just went out and, you know, my boyfriend had the people, the electric people come out and there was absolutely nothing wrong with our box. And so that was, that was really creepy. Um, I used to hear noises upstairs. It was a two story house. There was two rooms upstairs that were kind of connected. And when we first moved in, I was really excited because I wanted to make that into kind of like a, just like a hangout room for, our friends to come and you know to hang out and when I went up there for the first time it was such a weird feeling 
Like, something did not want me there. Like, you just felt very uncomfortable. So we just decided to keep, you know, it was like a storage area. And it, it eventually creeped me out so much that the staircase leading to the upstairs didn't have a doorway. And I made my boyfriend put the door on there because it creeped me out so much because you had to walk past the door and the staircase to get to the bathroom. And I hated it. <laughs> you know, I was alone at night, so I hated walking by there. So I made him put a door. And I hated going up there, too, because it was always such a weird feeling. And um, I was here stuff at night um, on one of the nights that he was off and we were sleeping in bed and I heard knocking around upstairs so I wake him up and I said hey Chris I think there's someone outside or there's someone inside or something's going on so he gets up he grabs his gun and he's he checks the upstairs nothing he goes out he goes outside checks the perimeter nothing and so of course he's mad at me he doesn't believe anything in the paranormal one he's upset and he's like, it's just your imagination. You're watching too many ghost shows and that. And I'm like, no, I heard something. Of course, he didn't believe me. And um, it was a short time after that, and I was in our living room watching TV. And in the middle of the day, he's asleep, middle of the day, watching TV, and I hear knocks and footsteps upstairs. When I know, we're the only two in the house. So this time, I didn't wake him up because I knew he'd get upset again, but I did tell him about it. But he never believed me, and that house just always had, always had a very weird feeling to it, and I just never felt welcome there, and we eventually broke up, and I moved out, um, which was kind of bittersweet because I didn't want to be in that house. I would get so scared at night, and I would feel so unwelcome in that house that I, I would literally keep my Bible next to my bed and I would read a passage every night just to make me feel better you know before I went to sleep because that's how weird I felt and I never had to do that in any other place I've ever lived any other place um, so yeah that, that house was definitely strange and I mean it's been a very long time since I've spoken with him and I don't know if he still lives there today but um, yeah so that's my story um, I've got a couple others I'm sorry, a couple of that I can tell. Um, I've had paranormal experiences my whole life. And so I hope you guys play this. I hope to hear it. I love you guys' show. And have a, a great day. Okay, bye-bye. I don't know that I could imagine being that isolated and dealing with that all at the same time at 19. I mean, yeah. that's that's just too much it's uh and it's not it's one of those things too where when you are the uh enthusiast Mm -hmm. of paranormal things and you enjoy watching paranormal shows and listening to paranormal podcasts that's where you end up getting ah it's just your imagination Mm -hmm. it just kind of people write you off very quickly when something actually does happen to you but i'm glad that uh you know she made it through it and it was probably all for the better but uh, my goodness yeah. What an experience. Thank you for uh, for calling that in and sharing that experience with us. Our phone number here, of course, 855-853-4802 to share your real ghost story with us. We would love to hear it. Of course, you can also write in through the website at realghoststoriesonline.com. And uh, as we always say, if you enjoy this show, if you enjoy the stories of ghosts and you, you like to hear them year round as we deliver them please help keep this thing a going and our uh, little ship afloat by becoming an epp that's an extra podcast person sign up on the website real ghost stories online.com five dollars a month is all we ask and uh, then you get to all the bonus episodes new one every single week for you packed with some of our best stories and access to all of those uh, other uh, bonus episodes all 60 some you can sit there and binge and get really disturbed, and then really start thinking shit's going on around your house, (laughs) even when it's not. So there you go. Uh, Please uh, support the show if you like it. We do greatly appreciate that, and thank you so much if you already are. Until next time, for Jenny Bruski, I'm Tony Bruski. Thank you for listening to another episode of Real Ghost Stories Online.